There's a story that is often told about Alexander the Great. Um, of course, you know he was a, a powerful ruler, powerful king, um, conquered many nations. Uh, but apparently there was one day in particular, as the story goes, that Alexander the Great was in, a, in the company of a great number of people. Uh, of course, he's a king. He's powerful. People are all about him. And in the midst of all of those people, one of his generals came up to him and said, Hey, I have a, I have a request to make of you. And Alexander the Great, knowing that this was a, a faithful general, uh, he, he led troops into battle, conquered kingdoms on behalf of Alexander the Great. He's like, hey, uh, you know, what is it? You know, whatever, whatever you need, just, just ask me. And he said, well, my daughter is getting married and I need money in order to put, put on a wedding for her. And so Alexander the Great um, says, well, how much money do you need? Like, what's this going to cost? And that general, in front of all of those people, made a ridiculous request of Alexander the Great. He asked for an exorbitant sum of money. And of course, when the crowd hears this, everyone is hushed, they go quiet. And all eyes are then on Alexander the Great watching for his reaction because of the size of the request that this general just made. And they were anticipating that he might get angry, he might rebuke the general. But as they watched, his face didn't grow angry or cold, but rather his eyes lit up and his face filled with joy and he responded to the general of course like go ahead and go to my treasure whatever it is that you need you go get it and I'm going to give it to you and everyone in the crowd is of course a bit shocked that he responded this way because it was a ridiculous request that the the general had asked of him an enormous amount of money and so as the man the general leaves he goes to see the treasurer The people, they can't help but gather around. Everyone's like, I need to understand what just happened here. And they began to ask Alexander the Great, like, hey, why would you give him such an enormous sum of money? Alexander the Great told the crowds that day that the general had done him a great honor. By requesting such a vast sum of money, the man had acknowledged that not only was he very, very wealthy, but that he was also incredibly generous and the crowds recognized that that general must have known something about Alexander the Great that the rest of them had not owned that there must have been a depth of relationship there that the general knew that in front of all of those people he could make such an extraordinary request and ultimately have that request met today I I tell you that story because I want to uh, ask you about how you relate toward God. How do you relate to God? Do you know Him and His nature and His character in such a way that you would boldly make a request on behalf of Him? That you know that you could come to Him and say, God, here is my moment of need. Would you meet me in this need and have confidence that He would indeed meet you there? Or do you relate to God as someone who is distant, who has no business being able to come before Him and make such a request? Today, the the focus of the sermon and, and Basically, what, what you're going to see the Apostle Paul writing to the Galatian church about, he's going to ask him a question. Do you relate to God as a son or as a slave? And he's going to try to convince them that true and rich and fullness and abundance is living life relating to him as a son or a daughter and not as a slave. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. We're going to begin today in verse 8. And Something important to note on the front end here is that the Apostle Paul is writing to the Galatian church. He is writing to a group of believers, not to a bunch of people that have never heard the gospel or don't know Christ. These are believers that he is writing to. And he's going to give them two warnings about ways that they could fall into being slaves again rather than relating to God as sons and daughters. So the first warning we're going to see here in verse 8. He's going to remind them of their former lives. He says this, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. He's like, hey, Galatians, do you remember the lives that you used to live? Um, In the Greco-Roman world, there was a buffet of gods that men and women would have worshipped prior to coming to faith in Christ. I mean, there was all sorts of gods. So there was the god of this, the goddess of that. He's going to refer a little bit later in this text to the the elemental things of this world. This might have been something like the earth, wind, and fire. Earth, wind, and fire. Sorry. Uh, Those were the sorts of things that they might have worshipped. Those were powerful things in their mind. And so when 
when they needed someone to work or act on their behalf, they would turn to these false gods, these false idols, and would worship to them in hoping that these powerful non-god deities could do something on their behalf. They were worshiping idols. See, Apostle Paul's like, do you remember your former way of life? The worship that you used to offer? Basically, what was happening among the Galatians prior to coming to faith in Jesus was they were finding life to be difficult in any number of ways. There were desires that they they had. They wanted to be fulfilled. They wanted to have the same safety and security and and, and love that, that we all ultimately desire, right? And so what they would do was, you know, if you were needing safety and security, things were imperiled, your life was in danger, well, you would go and offer a sacrifice to one of these false gods, head down the street, turn right, you know, this temple, this was the god or the goddess that could keep you safe, would provide security or blessing for your family. And they would go into these temples and they would offer themselves in worship, performing all sorts of religious rituals and offering sacrifices in exchange for blessing. Anytime um, you're going to think about idolatry, you should know that it requires a sacrifice in exchange for a blessing. And so, you know, you might have offered meat or money or you might have performed some religious ritual or act in exchange for the blessing of that deity. Now, if you wanted to maybe have a kid, you know, like you might worship then at the temple of the goddess of fertility or you know, if you wanted wealth or you wanted health, different temple, different God. And so what Paul is reminding them of is their former life of idolatry. And it was empty because idols promise things that they're never going to deliver. And Paul tells them what's at the heart of such idolatry. He says, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. He is referencing likely demonic spirits which were behind all of these idols, which were leading these Galatians prior to coming to faith in Christ to worship idols that were made of of wood. They were like carved out of wood or stone and to put their confidence in in them that if they would offer these sacrifices then they would receive blessings in return. Now it seems a little bit empty and it might even seem a little bit foolish to you and I that literally it's a it's a chunk of wood that someone carved and painted or it's a chunk of stone that someone has polished and fashioned. What would make you think there's any power behind that? Idols promise things that they're never going to deliver. It is blessing of whatever it is that you seek in exchange for a sacrifice. Now, if you would have lived back then and you would have gone into one of these temples, maybe you wanted to have a child and you longed to have a child and you believe that this goddess of fertility could provide you a child uh, and you'd gone and you'd worshipped and you'd offered sacrifices but you didn't become pregnant, let's say. You know what they concluded when they didn't become pregnant? It wasn't that that deity, whoever it was, that false god, couldn't actually make them pregnant. But instead, they, they surmised that they must not have sacrificed enough. They must not have gone far enough in offering themselves to that god. They must have fallen out of favor for some reason, so they needed to go and worship more. Another thing common to all idolatry is this demand for more. More, more, more. They never deliver what they promise, but they're going to require more and more of you. And it was incredibly destructive for these individuals. All sorts of pagan revelry. They'd offered their bodies. They'd offered their money, their stuff, even children. At certain eras in history, they'd offered to gods and goddesses seeking their blessing or their favor. So Paul is, is warning us about this ditch that we could fall into, this slavery to these things, who you offer yourself in service to them, but they give you nothing back in return. Now that seems pretty distant. I, I doubt you've ever been to the temple of Dionysius or any of those others and offered yourself in worship. But as much as we might shake our heads at people that worship stone idols or wooden idols, many of us, if we think about our former lives, We did something similar. You see, we all have this longing within us for fulfillment, for satisfaction, for ultimate security, to be loved and to to find our worth and our security and value in something, right? Maybe for you that value was in a person or a relationship. And you believe growing up, maybe throughout even your adult life, you thought, you know, if I can just find that 
person. If I can get in that relationship, I'm going to find that person that's finally going to make me feel full and satisfied. I'm finally going to feel like I'm worth something. I'm finally going to feel like I'm loved. And then I'm going to be satisfied. If I can just find that person, if I can just get married, have that relationship, then I'll feel full and I won't ever long for anything again. But then you find that person. And before long, that person inevitably sins against you because we all do. They let you down and they fail you. And while you might have kind of felt the butterflies for a while and felt really satisfied and fulfilled, before long that person lets you down and leaves you wanting. The reason is because that person isn't God. They're by nature not a God. They can never provide what your soul ultimately longs for. And in pursuit of those relationships, we often make sacrifices, right? We offer our time. We offer them our hearts. We offer them our bodies in exchange for what we believe is going to be satisfaction and love and fulfillment. But it's not there. We can't ever get that from a person. And maybe after that first relationship, you thought, well, maybe I found the wrong person. And so you went and found another one. And before long, they sin against you. And you're still not fulfilled. And so you find another one and another one and another one. And you're never satisfied. Or maybe for you, it wasn't a relationship. Maybe for you, it was success. You thought, you know what, if I could just achieve, if I could just accomplish something really significant and then really great, then I would feel worthwhile. Then I would feel like I'm worth something. And so you make sacrifices in order to achieve success. And so you sacrifice your time or your family or even your health, pursuing the thing. You want the promotion, you want the job, you want the achievement, you want the accomplishment. And as soon as you get it, you feel good for about 10 seconds and then it's on to the next thing. It can never deliver what it ultimately promises. You've made incredible sacrifices, but in order to keep feeling like you're worth something, you've got to accomplish something else. And then in the end, you're just like a hamster on a, a treadmill, right? You're just on, on the wheel. You're just running over and over and over trying to get somewhere, but never finding what really satisfies your soul. Or maybe in your life you believe that if you could just get a little bit of money, a few possessions, then you would be satisfied. Y'all, I remember very distinctly a time in my life where I thought, if I could make $40,000 a year, how could I possibly want anything else? I would have everything I ever need. Like, I would just be set for life. I would never ask God. If I just had that much money, then I would be satisfied. But you know what happens? No matter how much money you have, just as with every idol, you always believe that you need more. And so you sacrifice your time or your family or your health or your integrity, your values and your character in order to get money. And, and it, no matter how much money you get, you'll never feel secure. You'll never feel safe. You're, that, I, that money will never provide you with a sense of value or worth in and of itself. And here's the reason. It's because those things are by nature not God. In the next verse, Paul is going to tell us those, those things are weak and worthless. The elemental things of this world, you will never find in creation what can only be found in your creator. You and I were made for a relationship with God. God who is all powerful. God who is all knowing. God who is all loving. God who is all good. You were made to live in an intimate relationship with God as a son and a daughter of him and you will find your value and your worth and your security. You will find power and hope and joy in him, in the creator and not in the created things of this world. As silly as it may seem to offer yourself in service to these false gods Wooden idols, stone idols. We've done the same thing with different looking idols in our culture. And in the end, they leave us just as empty. The first thing that Paul warns us about is that we might chase after the empty things of this world, um, believing they're going to make us feel full, when in reality, they're always going to leave us empty. Let's read that again. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? He's like, hey, do you remember 
the slavery you once were in, the things of this world that controlled you. Maybe for you it was a a substance, right? You were addicted to something. And maybe it was a a substance. Maybe it was you were consumed with greed. Maybe for you it was a pursuit of sex. You just believed something would make you satisfied and you chased after it, but it never gave you anything in return. You were enslaved. Now, most of the time in the church, if we were to talk about such things, power, money, sex, all those, we're like, absolutely, those are sinful things. Don't pursue those. They're never going to satisfy you. But there is another temptation for us, another type of slavery that is very prevalent in the church today. John Piper would say this may be the most common type of slavery that exists among believers today. Um, Yes, you may go back to your old sinful ways, the overtly sinful things of this world, or you might turn back to a more sinister, a more subtle sort of idolatry that happens in our lives. Look what he says here in verse 10. He says, You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid that I may have labored over you in vain. You might go back to that life of license where you were just indulging your flesh, pursuing all the things that you ever desired. But he's like, on the other side of that, there's another form of slavery. And it's that you might go back to the law. You might start trusting in your observance of the law and believing that if you'll just keep the law, then you'll feel safe and secure. Your identity will be in that. You will be made righteous before God on the basis of the law. He's like, this is just as dangerous. John Piper says about about legalism or living under the law, he says it looks safe. It looks clean, it looks moral, it looks pure, but it's just as hellish as indulging any other fleshly desire that you have. It's because you are no longer worshiping your creator and living in a relationship with him, but instead you are now returning to slavery under the principles of the law. It is a danger to us. To live lives of self-righteousness before God. We were never intended to relate to God before relate to God on the basis of the law. We were meant to relate to Him as sons and daughters. You know what the law requires? Because every idol requires a sacrifice, right? You know what the law requires of us? When you're living a life of legalism, the law would say, here's a sacrifice you offer. Clean yourself up. Do better. Learn how to perform. If you're here today and you feel this certain pressure in your life to maintain a sort of image, to uphold a certain standard in your life, and you're just working really hard to be good and moral and pure and all of that, but it isn't something that's happening within you, empowered by the Spirit, but you're working hard for it in your flesh, you may be living a life enslaved to legalism rather than living a life of freedom as a son or a daughter of God. Paul warns us about both of these ditches that we can fall into as believers. Both of them are ditches of slavery. So in in chapter 4, verse 1, he's going to point us to a better way forward. Here's what he says. He says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So y'all know what's happening here. He's talking about in the case of someone who has received a great inheritance. You might think of a trust fund sort of kid, right? Listen, they don't give it to a seven-year-old. That would be incredibly destructive. Like seven-year-old probably wouldn't manage that very well. Instead, what a good father would do, if you're going to get an inheritance trust fund, um, you're going to be under a guardian. Maybe it's your parent, maybe it's somebody else in your life until such a time as you are mature enough to handle that, right? Until you're ready for it, uh, you don't necessarily receive all that. He's like, when a, when a kid is a child, even though they're an heir, they're, they're basically the same status of a slave. Though they own everything, they don't have the freedom to enjoy all of that. They're under a guardian. But then he makes a turn here that is so important for you and for me. He says this in verse 4. But I'm sorry. Yes, it is. It's verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. 
I was like, listen, there was a time when we were under the law, y'all. He's like, I get it. Like, God ordained that there was a, a certain period where the world was under the law. However, at just the right moment in all of history, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem those of us who were under the law. Jesus came. He was born of a woman. He knew the weakness of the flesh. He was born under the law. He knew what it was to live under the weight of the law. Jesus fulfilled that perfectly, and he came. He was sent by God to redeem those of us who were under the law. Now, redemption is an interesting idea. If you had lived in the first century when Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians, you wouldn't have had the same opportunity to file for bankruptcy that we have today, right? Uh, things were a little different. When you got into debt, you had to repay it. And if you found yourself in a situation where you didn't have the means to repay your debts, you know what your option was? Slavery. They would bring you to a public forum of some sort, and they would put a price on your head, basically the amount that you owed to your creditors. If someone would come and pay that amount, then you would be their slave for a predetermined number of years until such a time as you could work off that debt. You were enslaved to a person, right? The price that was put upon you, the price of those debt was of that debt was known as the price of redemption. So what Paul is telling them is, listen, we were all under the law. Because of sin, this is wages of sin is, is death, right? We owed a debt that we couldn't pay. The, 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 the debt that we owed was the debt of sin. So here's what Jesus did for us. God found us enslaved under the law, and so God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come and pay our debts on our behalf. Jesus Christ went to the cross, and he suffered, and he bled, and died in order to redeem us. However, what Jesus did not do was pay that price for us and, and then come and make us his slaves. Instead, what we're told is that Jesus came to redeem us so that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters. We are not supposed to relate to God on the, as the basis of slavery but rather on the basis of sons and daughters of God who have access to our Father and to all of His kingdom, to all of His riches. Paul's like, are you really going to go back to slavery? Are you really going to return back to that life that you once lived? What is happening to you, Galatians? He's shocked that it would relate to God on the basis of the law again. You've been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ who suffered and bled and died to set you free from those things, why would you return back to them? Now, there's a couple of things that are happening here. If you'll see in the text, the word sent is used twice. The first one is that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to secure our adoption, right? That was entirely the work of God, by the way. Like, we didn't earn that. There's no way we could have paid that debt. Like, it was a debt that was too vast for us to ever repay. So Jesus came and paid that debt for us. God sent Jesus to secure your adoption as a son or a daughter of God. But you know, even if you are a son or a daughter, you don't always feel like that. If you've been a believer for very long... You don't always feel like you've been adopted, like you're a son, like you're a daughter. As a matter of fact, there are often times that you might feel incredibly unworthy to be a child of God. You might feel like you don't belong and you have the accuser in your ear. The same demonic forces that might have led you astray before Christ, they're there whispering in your ear saying, you don't belong. Don't relate to God as a son. Relate to him as a slave, right? It's there. See, God sent his son Jesus to secure our adoption but he also sent the Spirit to assure us of our adoption. Look what it says in verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The Spirit is within us, teaching us to relate to God as our Father. That word Abba, it's a term of endearment, of intimacy, of fellowship with God that we can come to him. Something happens when we become children of God. When the Spirit indwells us and cries out for us, Abba, Father, it's when we face the difficulties of this life. And listen, they're going to come. We live in a fallen and a broken world. But when we're children of God, we respond to those difficulties differently. Children of God, when we face difficulties, 
we take them to our Father. And we come to Him who is actually powerful. The one who can keep us safe. The one who can provide. The one who saves us. The one who delivers us from our sin. That is who God is. We come to Him as our Father. And we ask Him to work on our behalf rather than believing that God may not work for us. Believing that we don't, have, we don't deserve to have God work for us and trying to manage our lives on our own. Rather than turning to the empty things of creation to try to fix what's broken in us, we turn to our Heavenly Father. Now, I don't know about you, but even in my own life, I have a tendency when, when let's say money gets tight. You know what I believe that I, I really need? I need more money. That's what I think, right? I need, maybe I need to work a few extra hours. I need to sell some. I need to do something in order to provide for me. But as a child of God, you know what we do? We come to our Heavenly Father. We make our needs known. We ask Him to meet those needs for us. We don't have to neglect our families in order to go make more money, in order to achieve security, right? We have security in our Heavenly Father, knowing it is His nature and His character to care for those whom He loves. So my question for you today is, do you relate to God as a father and you as a son or his daughter? Or do you relate to God like a slave, out of fear, always thinking that if you're going to receive any blessing from God, you have to somehow provide some sort of sacrifice? Well, here's, here's the beauty of what God has done for us. While every false god and every idol requires a sacrifice in exchange for blessing, here is what our great God did for us. He provided the sacrifice for us so that we might receive the blessing. The, the thing that God doesn't want us to do is to work hard to achieve, to perform whatever it is in order to endear ourselves to Him that He might bless us. No, God provided the perfect sacrifice for us that He might lavish His blessing upon those who call him Father. We receive this great salvation. We become heirs and adoption through faith in Jesus Christ alone, not through our works. Can I ask you that question again? Are you a son or are you a slave? Do you know God as your father? There's a famous pastor. He's his name is John Wesley. He wrote many of the old hymns that you may have sung in church growing up. Uh, he was a, an Anglican priest, the Church of England. He was ordained by them. He was very devout. Obviously, he preached and he served in the church. Uh, he was a righteous man. He didn't just serve in the church, but he served in the community. He was known for going into the slums and caring for the poor and feeding the hungry. He would you know, make sure they were clothed and fed and all the things that you might do. He was incredibly devout before the Lord. He prayed and he fasted. He was very faithful in that. He spent time memorizing the word. He was so passionate that even living in, in England, uh, he, he felt like he should go to the Americas to try to convert those that didn't know Jesus. And so he became a missionary to Native, Native Americans, left England, sailed to the U.S., spent years there as a missionary uh, working with Native Americans. But then one day after he had returned to England, he found himself walking down a street known as Aldersgate. And he said, right then, right there on that street, he said, my heart was strangely warmed. He said previously he had related to God as a slave and not as a son. But in that moment, he came to faith in Jesus Christ, not trusting in his works, not trusting in his service to those in the slum, not trusting in anything else, but trusting in Jesus Christ and his finished work alone. He said, my heart was strangely warmed. And he described himself. He's like, I went to the Americas that I might convert men, and yet I myself had not yet been converted. But on that day, when his heart was strangely warmed, he, he trusted in Jesus Christ and Christ alone to save him from his sins, and his life was ever, forever changed. Can I ask you again, are you a son of God is the Spirit of God cry out within you that you belong to Him, that He you can come to Him and relate to God as a son or a daughter rather than as a slave. You know, I have been the father to my children since the day of their birth. Like I'm their father, right? But there are certain moments in our lives 
where that is just so much more uh, clear for us, right? Where, where it's just like, man, I'm, I'm their dad. And, and the moments I remember where it's been most clear for us have been the moments when my kids, they were young, and something went wrong in life. You know, maybe they fell down and scraped the knee. Maybe there was a failure. Maybe someone had been unkind. They were hurting in some way. And they would run to me as their father. And they would jump up into my arms. They might be shedding tears. And I would wrap my arms around them. And I, and I would just remind them that I was, I was their dad. And that I, I loved them. And that I was going to take care of them. Like, maybe they lost something. Maybe they are hurt. I don't know what it was. But I'm like, I'm your dad. And I'm going to take care of you. And that's the way that God wants us to relate to him. You know, in a world where things are going awry, it's very easy to fall into temptation and to turn to other things, to try to justify ourselves or to try to take, to take care of our needs. What God desires of us is that we would relate to him as sons and daughters rather than as slaves. Will you, will you bow with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your nature and for your character God, that you invite us to relate to you as sons and daughters rather than as slaves. God, that you did all of the work required. You provided all of the sacrifice that was needed in order that we might be redeemed and adopted as your sons and daughters. I pray for the person who's here today that doesn't know you. Father, maybe they've done a lot of religious things. They happen to be in church today. God, they might know some scriptures. They may have prayed some prayers. But if they don't know you, I pray that today might be the day of salvation where they experience this transformation where your spirit is now within them testifying that you are indeed their father. Lord Jesus, may you work in our midst. May you draw us to faith, draw us to repentance. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, I would love to visit with you more about what it means to be a son or a daughter of God, to place your faith and trust in Him. But maybe you're here and you're a son or a daughter who's fallen back into some of those same old patterns, some of those same old sins. Maybe for you, you've fallen back into that addiction. Maybe for you, it's greed has overtaken you and you've turned back to those old idols and, and you're enslaved once again. James chapter 5, 16 tells us that we should come to God. He says, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. That you might pray to the God who loves you and cares for you. Maybe today the most spiritual thing you can do is bow right where you are and just begin to confess your sins before God and ask Him for deliverance. Maybe you need to sit down with your community group tonight and say, Hey, listen, it's, I've turned back to pornography. I've turned back to the addiction. My heart's become bitter. I've, I'm dealing with unforgiveness, and I need you to pray for me that I might be healed. And maybe for you, your idolatry looks a lot more spiritual, but it's just as sinister. Maybe you've fallen back under the trap of legalism, and you've been working really hard to perform, but you realize that it's never enough. You can never be good enough, and you need to just trust in Jesus once again, repent of your own righteousness, and turn back toward Him. Right now, I'm going to invite you to stand and just respond in obedience during this time of invitation, however God may be leading you. Um, trust in Him.